I want you to think about whatever piece of media meant the world to you when you were 14 years old. Whatever book or movie or TV show you were completely obsessed with that went way beyond how much you cared about anything else you liked. That thing that just seeped into your bones, it became a part of your identity, it informed the way that you saw yourself and lived your life going forward. That is the relationship that I have with this book, Boogie Pop and Others. Boogie Pop doesn't laugh. Both of them are the title, somehow, of this book. Uh, this came out in, I believe, 1998? Seven? It was one of the first light novels to gain popularity, sort of, as 1998. Uh, it's from Dengeki Bunko. They're making a new anime series to celebrate the 25th anniversary of, I assume, the imprint itself as this would only be turning 20 years old itself. So, this is, in many ways, one of the most influential light novels out there, but it's never received a proper anime adaptation, and the reason for this is simply that it would be incredibly difficult to do. It's not a story that necessarily translates all that easily into animation. It's pretty heavy on narration and dialogue. Not a lot really happens per se in the story of Boogie Pop. It's more contemplative and slow and thematically driven and I couldn't really tell you what I would consider to be the best way to adapt it. There was a live-action film that directly adapted just this book not too long after it came out. The film is mediocre. It captures the sort of the tone and look that I would expect from the story, and it tells it pretty much completely. There are some weird elements. There's a couple of things that are missing, and more importantly, um, they weirdly swapped around two of the characters' like designs. It's very strange. But overall, it's if you just wanted to learn the story of this book, the movie did an okay job of adapting the story. But the story is not by any stretch the most interesting thing about this book, nor does it seem intended to be. Right in the opening, one of the narrators tells you that it is a simple and straightforward story like any other. That the only thing that really makes it complicated in any way is the fact that nobody who's involved with it had the full picture of the events. The book has five narrators. It switches between five different parts, each of which contains one character telling their entire perspective on the events that transpired within this certain stretch of time, um, which happens to be uh, just a basically a few months out of a certain year when all the characters are in high school. It centers around a certain school, and to an extent, the school itself is even a character in the story because it's a very specific sort of high school the the properties of how it operates being important to realizing why things go the way that they do but hearing each of these characters five perspectives not very much really happens in any of their stories until the last one. It's only the fifth character, the one who has the least context for what the hell is going on, who actually gets to witness the main thrust of action actually happening, the climactic final battle of the book, which I assume will be the third episode of the anime. Now, the anime adaptation basically takes everything up to that final battle, uh, that final chapter. It, it adapts this much, this much of the book in just two episodes. Now, I was already shocked after the first episode when they crammed the entire first part into one episode, but I wasn't too surprised because the first chapter is slow and it's plotting, and it's almost all conversation, and it doesn't necessarily translate well to a visual medium. So I'm not too surprised that they crammed it into one episode. What shocked me a lot more was when they then crammed almost the entire rest of the book into episode two. Skipping over all of the themes, giving almost no attention 
to most of the characters and even cutting out one of the narrators, one of the, you know, five most important characters when you think of it in terms of who's telling the goddamn story. Uh, and just generally breezing through the story at such a speed that it doesn't really communicate any reason why it's good. Now, I can't really speak about this adaptation as though the book didn't exist. This is not a case where I can do that. The best I can give you, if you're somebody who hasn't read the book, has no interest, doesn't want to compare it to the anime at all, I watched it with my fiancé, we watched the first two episodes, she was completely bored and uninterested, I read her the book afterwards, and she loved it. That's the best I can give you for testimonial. I can't experience that, because watching this show, all I can think about is how it compares to the book, and especially because everything that is in the anime is in the book. All of it. It's almost word for word transcribed from scenes from the book. It's just that it cherry picks its moments at almost, I won't say random, it feels as though the show is trying to only communicate the things that are absolutely necessary to understanding what's going on and being able to progress the story forward once you get past the first book. Now granted, my relationship with Boogie Pop is also different from, you know, what it might be intended to be or what it would be for a Japanese audience because they only ever brought four of these to America. They brought the first three and the sixth book, which is the prequel. It sort of tells the backstory that is alluded to in these books. Um, those are the only ones ever brought to America, so that's all I've read. I've never read any of the, like, 20-plus, maybe even 30-plus, uh, you know, light novels that exist in the series. And from what I understand, the books get significantly crazier as they go. Once you get to book four, that's when things start getting really boogie and a bit less pop. And uh, because of that, I could see maybe the anime just trying to barrel through the early books in order to get to the more exciting stuff, in order to get to more action or more stuff that will translate better to screen. But it kind of leaves me feeling like, what in the fuck was the point? Why bother adapting Boogie Pop at this late stage if you're not going to do justice to the entire story? Now again, while I've read those four books, it's the first one that is my favorite. This book had such a huge impact on me, partly because it is very structurally driven. The structure of the book is one of the most interesting things about it. The fact that it's told from five narrators' perspectives, uh... A, chronologically, there's, like, the first story, the first episode of the anime takes place over the course of the entire book, and yet you never really learn anything about what's really going on because it's from the perspective of a character who doesn't know what's going on. It's just about his encounters along the way, yet he is kind of there at the earliest point and the latest point in the story, aside from the narrator who, who uh, who's who's reminiscing about what happened from a position of two years later, um, which itself suggests things about further arcs. It's a very densely packed novel. There's a ton of details. There's lots of little things that connect all the different chapters to each other. There's like a very dense web of, you know, interplay that lets you get the full grasp on when everything happened, who was involved with whom, just how deeply interconnected it is, and the later books continue to build off of that. You will still be learning about these characters later on, and you will still be calling back to the events of this book, and characters who maybe were just mentioned by name in passing in this one will be major characters in later books in the series. So it's kind of like everything is important. You can't really leave anything out and still be able to tell the story completely. But the most disappointing thing, more than anything, is just the absence of A, the central theme of the book, and B, any of the characterization. By blistering through the plot points so quickly, there just is no time to give flavor to these characters. So, to start with, let's talk about the differences in the first book. 
the first part, Romantic Warrior. Now, one thing that's missing right off the bat from the anime is the musical references. Boogie Pop was written by a guy who is a huge JoJo's Bizarre Adventure fan, and through JoJo, got into a lot of, like, really old, uh, like, classic rock and weird experimental music from the West, and much in the same way that the JoJo adaptation, you know, has has gone out of its way to make reference to, you know, those things and to, like, put ending themes, for instance, that are old, you know, old rock music that is referenced in the characters that should have been done with Boogie Pop. Romantic Warrior is a, a reference to an album by the band Return to Forever, a, like, modal jazz band from the, or, like, avant-garde jazz band. I don't really know what they're meant to be. I don't know what the genre label would be exactly, but they're, they're from, like, the 70s. It's a really great album. Um, I've, of course, listened, I've deep-dived everything that was referenced in this book. I've, you know, listened to all that music because I was inspired by it to go check that stuff out. And it's really a shame that viewers of the anime will not even be privy to this aspect of the book at all. But, you know, that's just a, a relatively minor detail. But so is the fact that uh, Boogie Pop is supposed to wear black lipstick and look really moody and dark and to never smile. Now, Boogie Pop is described occasionally as having this this crooked expression that's like attempting to smile but not quite accomplishing it. And it seems like the anime tried to create that face, but it just looks like Boogie Pop is smiling. And he's making that face the first time he appears, which is not the case in the book. The book is called Boogie Pop Doesn't Laugh. The whole point is that Boogie Pop is not capable of smiling because Boogie Pop is not capable of emotion. And I'll even say, Yuki Aoi is my favorite voice actress. She is playing Boogie Pop. I'm not a huge fan of her performance. I don't think that she plays the Boogie Pop character robotically enough. I think she plays it with a little bit more, like, emotion and also, like, a smugness. Not to say that Boogie Pop isn't kind of a smug character. And maybe I could even say that this interpretation would would not bother me if the characters were just more fleshed out and, and you know, written as thoroughly as they are in the book. But simply what's mostly missing from this first arc is... Again, the the details, the fleshing out, the stuff that actually makes the characters interesting and likable. For instance, in the scene where uh, the main guy, Tanaka, I believe is his name, um, is walking to school, we meet Takeda. Takeda Keiji. He's on his way to school, and we meet these two girls who are friends with him. The first is a blonde girl named Kamikishiro, and all you really see of her in the anime is her just basically discussing basic plot points, kind of exposition with the main character. In the original book, we learn about how both of them have this kinship because they're both dating when they're not supposed to be. The main character guy is on the disciplinary committee in the school, and this is why he's able to get away with certain things. It's a huge part of the book's message that the members of the disciplinary committee are basically all breaking the discipline rules because of the fact that they don't actually do anything. The teachers are the only ones who actually employ any discipline and all they ever do is lecture. The, the biggest theme of like the school in the book is that all kinds of crazy shit is happening at the school and nobody's noticing because the teachers are so, you know, uh, stuck on just like promoting the like ideal of what they think their students should be doing while none of the students are really doing it and like all the lectures and lip service to the idea of like discipline is not actually causing anyone to when they go home from school live their life any differently from how they would if you know if that pr pressure was not there so you know like it's pretty integral that the friendship of these two characters um, be communicated. And in that walk to school, there's a whole scene where she sings this song that she sings repeatedly throughout the book. That's like a major motif, uh, where she sings, Life is brief, young maiden, fall in love for those who know no tomorrow, because she's going to tragically die. Her death in episode two means nothing in the anime. 
It's like the most tragic centerpiece element of the book. It is the darkness in this book, is that that character dies because she is the most hopeful, cheery character. I'm like, I'm spiraling off in a thousand directions right now because I literally could rant about this for hours and I'm going to try to keep it relatively short. I'm going to try to just get to the point. What this book is about is normalcy. What it means to be normal, what kind of relationships people have with normalcy, and how those relationships interact. What it means to try and be normal in a world that is full of abnormal things. In a world where, you know, not only is society itself fundamentally not accommodating to, to the, the structure that we give our lives to feel normal, but also that there are forces that are straight up using the concept of normalcy as how they perpetuate their evil. So, the first story, the story of Takeda Keiji, is about a guy who is a very normal person who's in the most abnormal circumstance on like a surface level of everybody at the school because he's not planning to go to college. He has a job lined up for him at a design firm that his father like owns or a friend of his father owns. And so he doesn't have to study for exams because he's not going to take the exams. And this makes him unrelatable to everyone else in his class. They mention the fact that he's not taking his exams in the anime. And they also have a line where uh, Nitoki K, the, the pig tear pigtail girl who is the narrator of the last part um says to him like oh you're you know you're off following your dreams and and uh you're like it, you're distant from the rest of us but they never explain why and they never give they never have the line where he you know uh has a conversation with boogie pop about his job as a designer where boogie pop praises him for the fact that he's planning to take this job whereas his girlfriend, who Boogie Pop is in the body of, d was had the opposite opinion. She thought it was risky of him to not go to college, whereas Boogie Pop admires the fact, and like even says, like, you seem to have your feet on the ground. Like, the fact that he has a job lined up ahead of himself because he sees that as more mature. But he also considers him to be a romantic because he's pursuing something that is, you know, is non-obvious and, and that has... Uh, you know, they, they have a conversation about how it's basically being a, um, a craftsman. Boogie Pop calls him a craftsman. And that's where they, they start to bond over the fact that Boogie Pop, like, admires the job that he's doing and, and can, like, understand where he's coming from in a way that the, the girlfriend whose body he's inhabiting actually doesn't. I think the biggest thing missing from this chapter in the anime is the sense of time, the sense of progression, because it takes place over the course of a significant amount of time where he keeps having conversations with Boogie Pop on the roof like every day and like they really do become close friends and so in the anime it kind of feels like he met him three or four choice times and you can't really get a sense of how much time passes between there whereas the way it's described in the book deliberately makes it seem like this this large amount of time is passing and this is why like I had always imagined that the best way to do a Boogie Pop adaptation would be like a set of 45 minute OVAs and of course I know that's an unrealistic I mean wouldn't you want that for every goddamn light novel you know but like it just would have made the most sense to convey that sense of time to have all the conversations to have the scene where Takeda calls the girlfriend's house the details about the fact that this had happened to her before that like Boogie Pop is not a new occurrence that the idea that she had split personalities is something that she was taken to a counselor for five years ago. Um, you know, like, her, the whole structure of her family is missing. And all of this is going to be important because Boogie Pop is, of course, the main fucking character of the franchise. So, like, anything to do with Boogie Pop himself or... They don't even really clarify the fact that in the anime that Boogie Pop is meant to be a male personality. That in spite of being in a, in a, a girl's body... He is always referred to as a he. There's like, uh, he speaks differently. There's like a big deal made out of the fact that everyone thinks of Boogie Pop as this beautiful boy. And, um, you know, like the fact that he's speaking from the mouth of 
this guy's girlfriend. It's like, even though he himself, the boyfriend, the main character of the first episode, is not a terribly important character to the overall narrative of Boogie Pop, it's the fact that he's in a relationship with the most important character that makes his arc matter and makes all of the impressions and the conversations between them important. Now, the one thing that the anime does seem to fixate on, especially in this episode, as a theme is Boogie Pop's line about how, um, you know, you see a person suffering and don't think to do anything. Is this what society has brought us to? And this, this line mostly echoes through the mind of the main character throughout this first chapter, but what's missing is this conversation that expands on it, which is the moment which truly, like, solidifies the relationship of the two characters and is sort of why they are friends and why they have so much uh, admiration for each other. So... Uh, he asks Boogie Pop, the first time I saw you, what did you say to that homeless guy? And this, this exchange is in the anime where he says he was crying. You could clearly tell he was suffering just by looking at him, he said plainly. Here's the part that's missing. Takeda says, but, but, I sputtered then sighed. The rest of us ordinary people can't understand that way of thinking. Even as I said it, I felt pathetic. You're a good man, Boogie Pop suddenly said. Huh? I think I know what Miyashita Toka sees in you. Please don't say things like that with her face. When I meet her tomorrow, I won't know what to do, I said, realizing this meant I had completely accepted Boogie Pop as an independent existence. Boogie Pop made a strange expression. Beneath the low brim of his hat, his left eye narrowed and the right side of his mouth twisted upwards. It was a very asymmetrical expression that Toka herself would never make. Don't worry. I am me, and she is herself. Later, I wondered if that expression was a strange sort of grin, but at the time, it baffled me. It was a sort of grin that seemed both sarcastic and somewhat diabolical at the same time. I never did see him smile, though. But really, it's when you get to episode two that things really get ridiculous. And the second part of the book is narrated by Suema, the girl with the, uh, the braid. And, like, the early part of episode two works fine as a truncated version of what happens in the book. The conversation between her and the other girls in her class is a lot just better written in the book because it's a much longer conversation that feels more natural and has more like references to pop cultural things. It has more of like, uh, just the characters are a lot like naughtier and nastier, but not in like a, not in a like edgy kind of way, just in the sense that like the girls are making jokes about how Nagi's been killing as in one slip up and you miss your period. So like, you know, there's just like a lot more sexual connotations in the book. There's a lot like the, the book is actually, it's very unafraid to, to talk about sex, to have characters who are sexually active. All of that is missing from the anime. But more importantly, the the whole point of her going to Nagi's house is the conversation that happens after they leave Nagi's house, which is cut out of the anime version, which is the conversation where Nagi basically says to her that you are normal and that's why you shouldn't get involved in this stuff. Is like you have an opportunity towards normalcy and if you continue to pursue, like, you know, trying to find out about what happened to you five years ago which I don't even, like, they barely even talk about in the anime the fact that Suema had been, like, stalked by a serial killer five years prior, and that's why she has this interest in serial killings. And it is revealed that Nagi was the one who stopped the serial killer five years ago. So, like, they don't have that reveal in the anime. It just cuts straight from her being at Nagi's house to the next entire arc. And that arc does nothing to characterize the kid who is helping the Manticore. Like, all, again, all the scenes that happen there are in the book. But, like, the whole point of this guy's character is that he is a straight sociopath who doesn't... He, he just hates everyone, wants nothing to do with people. However, he puts up a perfect facade of normalcy. Like, this extensively calculated routine that he does in order to convey himself as the most blended in perfectly normal person around but he has like no particular feelings about anything going on and he's in love with Nagi because she's abnormal and falls in love with the Manticore for the same reason but like 
he, he, they also don't really mention that their plan is to eventually take over the world, that they're trying to, like, use this crazy drug scheme to eventually raise, like, a slave army and take over, but, like, they're completely, like, out of their depth and full of themselves. They don't mention the fact that the kid is obsessed with the band The Doors. There's no part where, as he watches the manticore dissolve a body, he gets No One Lives Forever by Oingo Boingo stuck in his head and just keeps repeating, no one, 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 no one lives forever! Over and over for an entire page. Like, this stylization is just not there. And even the original Boogie Pop Phantom anime, which, for those who don't know, the original anime was a completely non-canon interquel between the first two books. So, basically, the end of this book, um, there's an event that happens, and the, an the original anime just sort of speculates if this event had had a rippling effect throughout the city that causes all kinds of supernatural shit to happen. And the original, like, thematically, it doesn't really have much to do with Boogie Pop. It's, it's not even really, like, it copies the idea of having multiple narrators with an interconnected story, but it doesn't do it the same way the book does. It's more of an atmospheric, creepy, like, horror anthology kind of show. Uh, but, like, even that show, just the visual tone, the design sense was so much closer to the feel of the book. I mean, the character designs at least looked something like Koji Ogata's designs, which are heavily in the style of, like, the old Shin Megami Tensei and Persona games, which were, without a doubt, an influence on this. There's a part in the book where he even says that the story sounds like something that would be out of one of those school-bound RPGs. So, like, it's, it's meant to feel like a Shin Megami Tensei game. It's meant to be this dark, urban, atmospheric story. In the new anime adaptation, I don't so much mind the, like, stark whites that they used. I think that that aesthetic could work. You know, the original went for, like, pure, like, greens and stuff. But, like, it's just not stylized, and the character designs look fucking terrible. I only found out afterwards that, uh, that the original artist Koji Ogata had, like, gone on Twitter and had, like, a huge, like, he, like, shit all over the designs and said they were terrible, and I completely agree. The new designs suck, and I can't believe they didn't consult him to do something for the new anime. Like, what were they thinking? I also think the OP and ED are completely boring, just regular-ass songs. The, the actual visuals of the OP don't seem to have anything to do with the story. Um, and the original OP was badass. Like, the Boogie Pop uh, Phantom one was awesome. And, like, the one thing I can give this new show is that the music is pretty good. However, the book itself had a soundtrack made by Yuki Kajiura, my favorite soundtrack composer, which is one of my favorite soundtracks. And also, Boogie Pop Phantom has one of the most interesting eclectic OSTs of all time. It is a phenomenal soundtrack. This one will definitely not stick in my mind as well as either of those. So, even the thing I can compliment the production for the most, I can't say it compares to the others, and... Just the, the sheer amount of what was left on the cutting room floor here. As far as I can tell, I think they're going to skip part four in its entirety. Part four has a narrator who, again, he's, he, he's taking the approach of it's two years later and he's reminiscing. Um, he's one of the guys who was dating the blonde-haired girl who died in episode two completely unceremoniously. This whole chapter is dedicated to characterizing her from the perspective of others, and she is the heart and soul of the book. She's this girl who's sort of flighty and obsessed with love. She's always falling in love at the drop of a hat, and she's dating a whole bunch of different guys, and like, she's in and out of school. She's like, got home problems and stuff. Basically, in this book, where everyone has different relationships with normalcy. She's the only one who seems to in operate just entirely on her own whim. There is no real consideration for what society has built as what you're meant to do. She just is completely driven by her emotions and just does what she wants. And this is why she relates to this guy, 
um, who's who's the narrator of the chapter because he Akio is uh, he's just like a playboy kind of a he's he's not like a bad student but not a good one he's breaking the rules but not flagrantly he's uh, you know he ends up going to college like a regular ass guy. Uh, because of the fact that he basically um, pulls a huge stunt and burns all his social connections after her disappearance. Um, but, like, to just to go through what each character's sort of relationship with normalcy is, you've got, again, the, 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 the main character of the first arc, whose thing is that he, you know, he would just be a normal guy except for, like, in any context other than high school, where the fact that he is not planning to cram and go to college puts him, like, just makes him feel completely othered by everyone else in his grade. Um, then you've got Suema, who, like, because of the fact that someone tried to kill her when she was young, she's obsessed with abnormal psychology. And, like, she comes off as somebody who... Like, she's managed to fit in well enough. She can, like, sit around in class, but, like, everybody kind of looks at her as, like, the weird girl because she's kind of bookish. And she sees herself as, like, already too far from normalcy to completely relate to it. But Nagi, who who comes from, like, a truly weird background, um, you know, has completely foregone normalcy. She's, like, the most, the most normies re character in fiction. Uh, she's, like, the, she literally is only seen as a delinquent because of the fact that she deliberately gets herself suspended so that she can go do, like, superhero shit. And she's also a super genius, so she's able to pass in school um, because she just will study everything and, and keep her grades up so that she can continue to operate within the school and do her thing. But she has no interest in normalcy, no interest in keeping up appearances, doesn't care about her permanent record, because she's, she's kind of literally Batman. She has, like, a lot of money and means and can just spend all her time fighting crime, basically. So there just is... There's no restriction on her to live the kind of life that other people do. And that's the point that's what her her dialogue with Swema is all about is that she's trying to tell her like don't become obsessed with abnormal psychology go back while you still can so you don't end up like me and of course this advice backfires and as the books go on Swema increasingly becomes you know obsessed with the abnormal and with with Nagi herself um I'm trying to find, there's there's a line that was missing from the anime that is, like, the most crucial one. It really felt like every every chapter, whatever line I considered the most crucial was the one that wasn't there. Here we go. Uh, when, when she finds out that Nagi's dad is the author, which, by the way, in the book, there is no scene of her comically carrying around every single Kiri Masaichi book on her. Uh, she just names them all in her own head. Uh, but the conversation, uh, when she, you know, when she's surprised that Kirim, that it is Kirima's dad, she says, even as I, it, it never occurred to me, I wonder why not. Even as I asked, I knew the answer. I had unconsciously convinced myself that Kirima Seichi or any other writer was hardly likely to live near me. Perhaps I wanted the people that I admired so much to live in some higher realm of existence than I did. So you see how it's like she can't imagine that, you know, something she's heard of, something famous, is just around the block. You know, that it's just in her hometown. That Because we, we want to believe that for something to be abnormal, it must be in a whole different world. Because otherwise, what's our excuse? You know, how come you are not a famous writer? How come you are just going along with whatever is normal if, you know, if if it could be anyone from anywhere. Um, and the reality is that being abnormal is not that different. Like, you still are a functional human in society if you, you know, are even able to, like, if you are able to even communicate well and be intelligent, you have to have some grounding as a person. You can't just be made up of a fucking you know, fairy dreams. It's like there's always psychological reasons for why a person becomes the person they are. And Nagi's arc, again, is about that. The reason they go to her house and her house is super normal in contrast with the legendary persona that she has is that, you know, even a person as crazy as Nagi has to go home and live a life. 
You know, she has to have somewhere to sleep and like she's she's not using magic everyone thinks that she's a witch they call her the fire witch which is a king crimson reference by the way to summon back the fire witch to the court of the crimson king should have been the ed just saying should be her theme song should play every time she comes on screen that's the digibro adaptation of that story like here I was, just some normal girl from a typical middle-class nuclear family, and I'm sitting here listening to the Fire Witch herself talking about her atypical life. Her whole situation just felt sort of unreal to me. It's no wonder that she acts the way she does. She'd hardly even been brought up in anything close to a proper environment. Like, you know, I'm not these are not subtle themes. This is what the book's about. It's just not there. So then you get to the third guy, and his... The, the guy who's helping the manticore, and the whole point with him is that he's putting up a facade of normalcy while being the least normal. And ironically, the biggest mistake that Kiri Managi makes is that she continually blows him off because she thinks he's just some normal guy. She never suspects him of anything. She never even tries because she keeps telling him, oh, you're normal, you just stay out of this. Not realizing that, you know, it's not always obvious who who are the crazy people just because she's got this theatrical presentation of herself and thinks she's so smart he skates right under her radar and ends up committing all these heinous acts and killing her best friend ultimately so um you know that's part of the tragic irony of this whole thing so then you got part four and you know again this is a guy who is not necessarily trying to be abnormal he's just kind of living by his own whim um but he's not He's not so, like, he, he's just not so whimsical, you know? Like, he's, he's living by his own impression of what he wants to do, but ultimately he's trying to keep friction to a minimum and just kind of skate by, as compared to Kami Kishiro, who he has this tryst with detailed throughout the, the chapter, who, because she throws herself with open arms at the world you know, she is bound to get hurt. Like, it's not... She... Part of the reason that this is the character who dies is that if anyone was going to die, it would be the person who can't help herself but to try to help everyone, to try to involve herself, to be the one who helps out the stranger, you know? Like, if Boogie Pop has to ask, you know, is this the result of a society? Is that you, you know, you see someone suffering and you don't do anything? Well, the one girl who did do something for that guy is the one who ends up suffering for it. And just by chance, you know? But, like, that is why we don't do things for each other, is we're scared, you know, of these kinds of situations. So, that's, that's all the stuff that was left out of these two episodes. We're going to get the third episode. It's probably just going to tell the rest of the story just concluding with the big action scene that's going to come at the end. And none of the themes about normalcy will really have been explored. You know, even if they keep in... Like, again, I don't think there's been anything in the anime that wasn't in the book. There's nothing that they added in originally. And they probably should have. They probably should have took out some of this stuff and added in some more stuff just to make it flow as an anime. But, like, so much had to be culled for time. Like, for instance, at the start of episode one, when the, uh, the guy is waiting at the train station and the, um, the, the psycho dude with a girl, like, comes up and they're like, they, they're like, hey, what's going on? Looks like you got stood up. And then they just kind of hightail it out of there. And then they go to a karaoke booth and he drugs her drink. In the book, it's a double date. And, like, the, re the relationship between him and this girl is that, like, she's in love with him and he doesn't give a fuck about her because, again, he's just a sociopath and he's like taking delight in the fact that he's making her like he he kills her and they overwrite her memories so that she forgets her love for him and he takes like this sick pleasure out of the fact that he has like taken this girl who was in love with him and like erased that emotion because he found it annoying you know like that's the real gritty dark gross undercurrent that makes that chapter so creepy I am going to stop now because I could talk about this forever. I can literally talk about this forever. It's one of my favorite books. If you enjoyed this anime at all, I highly recommend you go read this and, you know, pay attention to what it's, what it's actually about because the anime is not really going to convey that. So it's like I almost can't decide what about it bothers me the most. If it's 
the fact that I can't really care about the characters in the anime because none of their best moments are there, none of their best dialogue shows up, none of their best scenes together, they don't have a lot of chemistry because you don't get to spend time with them as pairs, you know, you don't, the, the main, the main guy of chapter one, of episode one, is like one of my favorite characters in the book, and he just seems completely milk toast in the anime. Um, and the other guy, who's my other favorite, is completely cut out. And uh, Kami Kishiro is also one of my favorites, and she is basically just in there to die. Uh, you know? Like, again, I really just got the feeling that they were just trying to plow through this book, that they're just trying to get it over with so they can get to more action centric books. And it's just really a shame because. It, this book is very important to me, and seeing it handled in such a sort of just like flippant way, um, you know, it's it's almost an insult to something that I care so much about. And if you do read the book, please, by all means, listen to all the music as well. Listen to fucking Heartbreaker, the live version that uh, by Grand Funk Railroad that he had as his BGM when he wrote the afterword. Because it's fucking epic, and you can totally hear how he would have had it playing in his head during the final battle scene, because it sounds like final battle music. It's, you know, it's just, you gotta, you really gotta dive into the bones of it. This is such a cult novel, I just can't understand why they would bother making an anime out of it, um, if they weren't gonna uphold the cult aspects. Why isn't the Manticore wearing lipstick in the anime? Part of her thing is that the, the girl whose body she stole was wearing lipstick when she took it over, and the lipstick is now grafted onto her lips because she copied it along with the rest of her body. There's no line about how not even her parents noticed that she had been replaced because she was just like a studious girl and her parents stayed out of her way. Like, the the commentary that it makes on... the the. the the whole thing is just leaden with commentary on, like, the way that Japanese society functions and how the addiction to normalcy leads to everything in this being possible. Oh, my, my brain is starting to fucking turn into popcorn, so that's it. Go read Boogie Pop. Maybe I'll do another video about this book in the future and uh, do a proper analysis video, because clearly I have a lot to get off of my chest. Uh, bye!